Many of you may have heard a cardiac physical exam presentation go something like regular rate and rhythm, normal S1 and S2 heard, no murmurs, rubs, or gallops. In this video, we will be going over heart sounds and the physiology behind each of the heart sounds listed here so we can better understand what each of the terms in the latter half of this presentation implies. If there is a specific heart sound that you want to know about, you can quickly jump to the timestamp for each of these heart sounds down below. The main questions that will guide your thinking about heart sounds will be, where is the blood? And where is the blood trying to go? We'll start off first by talking about the basics by starting with S1 and S2. Here, I have drawn out the cardiac cycle with systole here and diastole here. As the heart transitions from diastole to systole, the blood is mainly in the ventricles as the ventricles start to squeeze. As the ventricles squeeze, the blood in the ventricles pressurize and push onto the neighboring valves. In the right ventricle, this means that the blood pushes against the tricuspid valve, which closes, and the pulmonic valve, which eventually opens. In the left ventricle, this means that the blood pushes against the bicuspid or mitral valve, which closes, and the aortic valve that eventually opens. In a normal heart, the closing valves create a thumping sound while the open valves allows for blood to flow through it like a quiet, gentle stream. The sound of the mitral and tricuspid valves closing simultaneously during the transition from diastole to systole creates the S1 sound. As the heart transitions from systole to diastole, the blood is mainly in the pulmonary vasculature, aorta, and atria. In early diastole, as the ventricles relax, the interior of the ventricles become lower pressure. When this happens, the aortic valve and pulmonic valve slam shut because of the relative high-pressured blood in the aorta and pulmonary vasculature pushing back toward the ventricles. While this happens, the blood in the atria gets sucked into the ventricles through the mitral and tricuspid valves that open. The sound of the aortic and pulmonic valves closing simultaneously during this transition from systole to diastole creates the S2 sound. There are certain scenarios that can cause the aortic and pulmonic valves to not close in sync, which leads to what people call a split S2. When you hear a split S2, what you should be thinking about is one of the ventricles is not completing its systolic cycle in time. This can be due to a couple things, more blood, stenotic valve, weak ventricles, or an unsynchronized depolarization. What is meant by more blood is that the ventricle is getting more blood than it is normally used to, thus the ventricle needs more time to squeeze out the extra blood. This would be the case when people take a deep breath which acts to pull blood into the lungs, thus more blood is brought into the right heart and less blood is brought into the left heart. This is called physiological splitting. It can also happen if there is an atrial septal defect that constantly shunts more blood from the left atrium to the right atrium. Thus, the right ventricle constantly gets more blood than it's supposed to. What is meant by a stenotic valve is that the outlet valve does not open smoothly when the ventricles contract, thus basically acting as a partial obstruction. With a pulmonic stenosis, for example, the right ventricle would have to generate more pressure before the valve starts to open. Similarly, if you were to have conditions such as pulmonary hypertension, the right ventricle will again have to generate more pressure before the valve starts opening, thus delaying its systolic cycle. What is meant by weak ventricle is that in some cases there are conditions like myocardial infarction of the wall of the ventricle, which prevents the ventricle from being able to squeeze at its maximum capacity. This, as you may imagine, would cause the ventricle to have a harder time squeezing out the blood that it is provided, thus taking a longer time during systole. Lastly, for unsynchronized depolarization, the ventricles are working fine, but one ventricle starts contracting earlier than the other one. Thus, the one that started contracting later, understandably, completes its systolic function later. This would be the case in bundle branch blocks. The key to understanding murmurs is again to think about where the blood is mainly and where is it trying to flow to. Before, I mentioned that the blood flowing through the valves in the normal heart in normal conditions is much like a quiet gentle stream. Now if you were to imagine the same stream except this time you introduce some other things like 
heavy rain that causes a massively greater amount of water to flow through, or there were some obstacles obstructing the water flow, or there was another emerging stream flowing in the opposite direction, you can easily imagine how each of these can create a rough, loud current, which we call turbulent flow, which are the murmurs that we hear in our heart. One of the most common types of murmurs you will hear are called physiologic murmurs, which are illustrated by the first analogy, where there is simply a larger volume of water flowing through the stream that causes turbulence. These types of murmurs are more often heard in children and adolescents. I think of it as children and adolescents have smaller cardiac anatomy, so their anatomy develops this turbulent state with only a little increased blood flow. The next imagery of the stream with obstacles in the way represents stenotic valves, which are valves that are not able to open well. You may hear some people say that the valve is tight when they describe a stenotic valve. When blood flows through this essentially narrowed valve because it does not open all the way, it causes turbulent flow and the characteristic crescendo-decrescendo murmur. In systole, a stenotic Aortic or pulmonic valve sounds like this because as the ventricles start to generate pressure, there is very low flow at first as the valve struggles to open, thus starting off with a softer sound. And as the ventricles generate a strong enough pressure, the valves open more, thus creating much higher flow through the valves and leading to a crescendo sound. As the blood nears completion of being ejected from the ventricles, less blood flows through the valve, thus decrescendoing down back to a softer sound. A similar sound can be generated during diastole when the ventricles relax to pull blood through stenotic mitral or tricuspid valves. The imagery of the stream merging with another stream flowing in the opposite direction represents regurgitative valves which are valves that have lost their ability to function as one-way valves and stop the blood from going in the wrong direction. In examples like mitral regurgitation, the left ventricle contracts, but the mitral valve fails and allows blood to go into the wrong direction into the left atrium, which causes turbulence. These regurgitative valves produce a characteristic hollow systolic murmur, representing the constant flow of blood backwards as the valve fails. During systole, a hollow systolic murmur may correspond to either a regurgitating mitral or tricuspid valve, while during diastole, a hollow systolic murmur may correspond to either a regurgitating aortic or pulmonic valve. If you would like to try to replicate these crescendo-decrescendo and hollow systolic murmurs to train your ears on your own time, I have been taught this little trick where you cup your stethoscope in your hand and on the back of your hand, you trace an upside down V or U to simulate a crescendo-decrescendo murmur and you drag two or three fingers across in the straight line to simulate a hollow systolic murmur. The last type of murmur we'll talk about is a continuous murmur. The merging stream imagery can also be used to illustrate the machine-like continuous rumbling murmur caused by a patent ductus arteriosus. Here, you have a narrow pathway for blood to flow from the higher pressure aorta to the lower pressure pulmonary arteries, which causes the flow through the PDA to collide with the pulmonary artery flow. I personally also think that there is likely an element of the flow murmur physiology going on here too, with the fast flow going through the narrow pathway causing a murmur. This would be a good time to talk about mid-systolic clicks. Mid-systolic clicks are caused by an abnormal, somewhat floppy mitral valve that is able to still function to keep blood from regurgitating, but has to balloon out into the left atrium first before it becomes taut. Imagine how when a parachute opens up when a person goes skydiving. The parachute catches air, the strings become taut, and at that moment, there's a characteristic slapping or boom sound from the strings and parachute being put under tension. This slapping sound is analogous to the mid-systolic click of the mitral valve. The reason that the click happens in mid-systole is that some blood needs to be pushed into the mitral valve first before the valve and the chordae tendineae are put under tension. 
Next, we'll talk about gallops, which include S3 and S4, which sound just like the sound of valves closing in S1 and S2, except they're not caused by valves and they occur at specific points during the cardiac cycle, specifically during early and late diastole. As we mentioned previously, during early diastole, the ventricles start to relax, which causes the majority of the blood in the atria to be sucked into the ventricles due to their lower ventricular pressure. In conditions where the ventricles are distended, the new blood from the atria falls into the larger ventricles. It's kind of like dropping a water balloon into a deep well. The sound of the blood being dropped down into the larger ventricle causes the characteristic S3 sound. Because this occurs in early diastole, the S3 sound comes right after S2. A typical example of a condition that causes an S3 sound would be congestive heart failure, specifically a systolic heart failure, also known as heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. In late diastole, there is an atrial contraction that occurs which provides an atrial kick to push some additional blood from the atrium into the ventricle. In the cases that we have an abnormally stiff heart, this atrial kick is almost like trying to stuff blood into an already full ventricle that can't take any more. The atrial kick against a non-compliant ventricle leads to the characteristic S4 sound. Because this occurs late in the diastolic phase, the sound comes right before the S1 of the next cardiac cycle. An example of a condition that causes an S4 sound would be heart failure with preserved ejection fraction, also known as diastolic heart failure. The last heart we'll discuss are rubs. In the normal heart, the heart moves smoothly in the pericardial sac as the visceral and parietal layers are well lubricated and allows for good sliding. In conditions that cause any kind of inflammation of the layers, the visceral and parietal layers become more sticky and causes a squeaky rubbing sound as the heart is moving through its cardiac cycle. Because the sound comes from rubbing of the layers, it can be heard during any or all of the phases of the cardiac cycle. And with that, we've covered all the heart sounds that we have listed at the beginning. Thanks for watching, and I hope this was helpful.